So today, I can have that slide up, please, Chris. Thank you. Um, I want to continue on the topic I shared last week. I want to give you the second part of last week, the thinking wars, what's going on upstairs in our thoughts and our thought lives, our thinking patterns. Just a quick recap. I want to make two statements from last week. Remember this, that single thought has got the power to become a train of thoughts that builds incredible, incredible momentum, that runs and rushes, that becomes a belief system and can eventually become your worldview through which you experience life. That single thought, that's where it starts. Secondly, what do you do? You have the power to arrest any thought and take it captive and strangle the living daylights out of it until it's got a tap out. And then you are free from that thought. And it doesn't become a train of thoughts that becomes a belief system that becomes a worldview. So there's the recap from last week. So today I want to talk about the lies we end up believing, living, and perpetuating. You know, we can actually end up living lies out. And we perpetuate this way, this lifestyle of living a lie out. Now, our problem, somebody said this, our problem isn't so much telling lies, though for some people that still is. <laughs> but our problem isn't so much telling lies but more believing lies and living them out. What we really believe always has a way of manifesting itself in our lives. It's true. You see, friends, our adversary, the devil, whom Jesus calls him, Hasatan, In fact, in John chapter 8, Jesus calls him, Jesus calls him the father of lies. He is the father of lies. In other words, he is the very source, the origin of all deception, of all lies that we believe. He is the father of lies. Be aware, he is the father of lies. And the very thoughts that he wants us to think, if we allow them, will become a nest in which the lies incubate and they multiply and they give birth to more deceit and more lies. When we accept a lie, that thought that is a lie, when we accept it, it grows unless we assault it with truth. That's the only remedy for the lie is truth. And it takes faith to stand up against lies. You know what happens with a lie? You actually start to feel like it's a truth. That's the danger. The lie can become so real to you that it feels like it's a truth. And you've got to stand up against it with faith. So let's talk a little, about, a little bit about the lies that we end up believing and living and perpetuating. We live in a world where lies abound. It is no wonder that Jesus announced himself as the truth. I am the truth. You only say that if you know lies are everywhere. People are believing lies. They believe lies about themselves and lies about God and lies about others and lies about life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Dallas Willard wrote in Hearing God, we truly live at the mercy of our ideas. I want you to think about that. We live at the mercy of our ideas. The ideas that we believe in our minds and then let into our bodies because we are a complexity of, as a human being, a complexity of spirit, soul, and body. And it, that little thought here, 
when we allow it to take root, it starts to permeate the rest of us. And when we let it into our bodies, it actually starts to shape the trajectory of our life. It starts to shape our future. It starts to influence and determine what our future will look like. John Mark Comer says this, but when we believe lies, ideas that are not congruent with the reality of God's wise and loving design, and then tragically open our bodies to these lies and let them into our muscle memories, we allow an ideological cancer to infect our souls. We allow ideas that are cancerous to infect our very lives. We live at odds with reality, and as a result, we struggle to thrive. We struggle to thrive because reality does not adjust itself to our illusions. It's powerful, that. He goes on to say, to apprentice under Rabbi Jesus is more than just to enroll as a student for a daily lecture in his master class of life. It is also to enlist as a soldier and join his fight to believe truth over our lives. Or over lies. <laughs> That's what I should have said. Friends, Scripture doesn't teach us that our rest in Christ means we are not waging war at all. What it does teach us is we are not waging war the way the world does. We are not waging war as human beings wage war. But we are waging war. Christ ones. That means Christians. Christ ones. Beloved followers of Jesus. Christ ones. Let us be quick to discern our thinking patterns and our ways. And quick to discern when they are not the gospel of Jesus' thoughts and ways. Quick to discern them. Not slow. Awake and sharp to discerning them. Arrest them. Strangle them. Kick them out. Friends, Scripture also doesn't teach us that our rest in Christ doesn't include a fight. We don't fight against people, the Bible says. The world fights against people. We don't fight against people. We realize there are principalities and powers that are at work to try and deceive and accuse and pull us away from truth. So we're alert to that. But we fight. And we fight the fight of faith. And the fight of faith is believing truth. Even in the face of that which doesn't look like it's real. Oh, sorry, it doesn't look like it's truth. In other words, when the circumstances look like they are not the truth, what are you going to believe? So faith is this. Faith is not denying circumstances. But faith is not allowing the circumstances to influence your future. An enduring faith is needed. You see, if faith was just... All right, there, <laughs> let me, no, I don't want to get into trouble here. But there are different moments and different types of experience of seeing God break through in our lives. There are times when you will speak to a mountain and it just goes. It just, suddenly it's gone. The atmosphere shifts and changes. That, that looming fear is just gone. Bang. And there are other times when you've got to, you've got to keep on, keeping on against it. And the one's faith... And it's in a moment it happens, and the other is enduring faith. You need both. Because the enduring faith, the Bible says this, that the testing of your faith, you see, hear what I'm saying? I, I, I believe in miracles. I've seen them happen. I, I want more to happen. I don't see enough of them. But here's, a, here's the deal. If every time I just said, and it did, it's different to this. 
The testing of your faith develops endurance, the Bible says. And endurance develops strength of character. And character, hope, which does not disappoint. You see how you need both faith and enduring faith. And sometimes this thing, the thoughts here, require enduring faith. Because the lie has taken root. And you've got to say, no, the truth is this. The truth is this. I am going back to the truth. I'm going to keep on going back to the truth. So, so here's some quick lies we end up perpetuating. It's got to be perfect. I've got to be perfect. What a load of baloney. Guess what? You live in a world where there are too many variables. There's too many other things happening outside of your control. You can't live under the lie that it's got to be perfect. You will be a, a, a sorry human being. That's a lie we perpetuate. I've got to get it right exactly all the time. Jesus is perfect. Yes, God says be perfect as I am perfect, but there's only one way to be perfect. And that's in his righteousness and in his ability and in him and not in yourself. Too many Christians, too many people are trying to be perfect in themselves. You can't. Secondly, secondly, or second of all, I need to have more control. I've got to fix that. I, I've got to have a little bit more. Give it, I need it. And, I'm, and, and you overstep your boundary. You overstep. And that overstepping causes chaos in relationships. God is the only one you must give control to. God. I invite you, God, in. Not me. I will guard. I will influence. I will shape. But I don't have control. Third one. I'm not lovely like others. I'm not as good as others. I'm not as beautiful as others. I'm not as clever as others. I'm not as gifted as others. I'm not as lovely as others. I'm less than. Others are, are just luckier than I am. They're just better than I am. That's a lie that we believe and we live and we perpetuate. And we've got to go back to the gospel always. What's the gospel of Jesus? What does God think about you? What does God say about you? What does Jesus speak over you? Because if you believe a lie, you will perpetuate a lie and you will live out a lie and you will not live in the gospel freedom that Christ offers us. I'll never be as happy as they are. Wow. People believe that. You look at the neighbors you look at your sister, you look at your aunt, you look at social media. Gosh, they're just so happy. I'll never be as happy as that. You will live in what you believe. You will experience what you believe. God, the gospel of Jesus, he, he says, I have joy inexpressible for you. What are you going to believe? I'm never going to have that joy or I am going to have that joy because Jesus has given it to me in the gospel. And I understand the gospel and I will not let any other thought that's against the gospel take root in my life to become a train of thought, to become a belief system, to become a worldview. I want gospel of the kingdom. Those good things never happened to me. Believe it, and they won't. It's that simple. You know what Jesus says in John 8, 32? He says, he says, and you, if you abide in my teachings, if you abide in my gospel, my good news, if you abide in my logos, the words coming out of my mouth, abide, think, I want you to think of what abiding is. Abiding in the vine, branch, it, it, it's, if you abide in my truth, 
or my scriptures or my gospel, whatever you, where you want to describe it, then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Now, here's the challenge. Do you know that he doesn't say, and love will set you free? He doesn't say, faithfulness will set you free. He says, truth will set you free. He says, I am truth. You've got to be so aware of any lie that you are thinking, believing, and living because you will be captive to it but only the truth of the gospel of Jesus. And abiding and knowing what that truth is, that's the truth that sets you free. And whom the Son, Jesus, who is the truth, sets free, is genuinely free. Two major pitfalls that we have. Number one, is believing something is truth. This is a serious problem that we have. Something comes in, and it's not a truth, but you let it take root, and before long, you actually now believe it's the truth. So take, for example, I'm, I'm always amazed at this one. Like, it's so frustrating for me. I meet some of the most, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very, um, let's see what I want to use, almost superficial, because I'm talking not even about the depth of personality now. I, I meet some people who are, they, they are beautiful or good looking if they're a man, they, and yet they believe they are ugly. It astounds me. They, have, they believe it, it's become truth to them. Friends, when that happens, we are locked and captive we are no longer free, and it influences everything about how we live life. So the danger is realize what is truth and what's a lie. And who can tell you that better than Jesus and the gospel? That's where you're going to find the truth always. So if what you thinking is a truth is against the truth of the gospel, you've got to realize it's not a truth, it's a lie. And if you still aren't sharp enough, to know that, and I don't mean this in a, in a patronizing way, if you're still battling with it, let me rather say that, if you're still battling with it, ask a Christ one, not just a Christian, even though they mean the same thing. Ask somebody who, who walks in faith, who's led by the Spirit, who knows the gospel. Ask them, is this the truth? And listen to what they say, so you can be free of lies that you have allowed to become a truth in your life. Another example, thinking, these are the lies we perpetually live and believe and become. Thinking that by continually correcting someone, you can bring out the best in them. Good luck with that one. By continually pointing out how they can do that better will certainly make them blossom and flourish. Jesus, the gospel incarnate, does not perpetually point out your mistakes. He covers over them with his blood. And he pulls you into a freedom where he says, you are not defined by that, but by who I am and what I speak over you. You cannot change somebody by perpetually trying to make them change. Having unfair expectations of yourself and others leads to feelings of unworthiness. Unworthiness doesn't cause anybody to thrive. Such thoughts can become well-worn paths, friends, and a train of thoughts that establish strongholds that hold us captive. Another one. There are these things called codependent relationships where lies are lived out and hold us captive in these codependent relationships. Often people in codependent relationships don't even know that they are in codependent relationships because they've become deceived about, the authentic, about the, the, this kind of relationship. 
per perspectives get distorted. Yet they justify it as genuine love. But it's not genuine love anymore. It's become need-based. One feels so that they, one, one feels that the other person cannot do without them. And they're going to take care of their life. And the other person eventually gets to a place where they go, I can't do without you. I need you so much. And you, you enter this, this thing which is so dysfunctional and robbing people of power and love. And it's not love. And so we, we, we can be believing lies about relationships. And then the second part of that is believing it will never change. This is another massive pitfall. And I know in the first meeting last week, I got to touch on this. In the second meeting, I didn't. So I want to do it again. Um, believing something will not change. I've tried that. It didn't work. I've tried it so many times. It's never going to work. If you believe that, you'll experience it. When we're thinking like this, it shows we have stopped believing. It shows that faith is no longer operating. Anything outside of faith is sin for the Christian. In other words, God loves us, but he does not enjoy those, that way of thinking. When we've accepted a lie that it'll never change, we, we have become powerless, we have become hopeless, and we have become helpless. And then we're just surviving. And a survivor is, no, is somebody who's not thriving in the gospel. A survivor is somebody who feels everybody's against me, everybody's falling around me, I'm the only one and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just hang in here and it's my energy and my ability to persevere now. And it's not the gospel. The gospel is, it's not, it's not in me, it's by the Spirit of God. It's not me, it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. I lean into His faithfulness. I lean into, I'm in His righteousness. I'm empowered by His grace. That's where my freedom is. That's where my power is. That's where my liberty and truth is. It's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. At Emmanuel, one of our core values and cultures is a culture of freedom and transformation. When you abide in the truth, then you are truly free. And when you are truly free is when there is the most acceleration and transformation. We've got to fight untruth, the untruth that we are powerless to change. I'll remind you of this. With God, is there anything impossible? No. Nothing. Zip. Zero. Nothing. I shared this from Muhammad Ali last week. It's impossible. Well, I mean, he says, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Now, I know it's humanistic, but gosh, it's still good. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration. It's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. Now, imagine when you are rooted in the Christ the incarnate God incarnate, the one who came and manifested the kingdom of God. When you're abiding in him and in his power and in his ability, nothing is impossible for him who believes. Rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now, I'm going to challenge you with this. What are three things you believe about yourself? I didn't say what are three lies. I said what are three things you believe about yourself. When did you first start to believe them? And why do you think they are true? Now you might want to 
write that down or something, because that's a really little good practical thing to do. What are three things you believe about yourself? When did you start believing them? And why do you think they are true? A little bit of non-judgmental self-awareness is very helpful. Okay. Let's close with this. God wants us to live under the influence of the gospel, the truth. He wants us to live under the influence of the spirit of Christ. Not live under the influence of, of humanistic thinking and what the world is telling you and what your cousin keeps telling you and what your, it's, it's like, what is Christ? What is the truth of the gospel saying? I want to live under the influence. Eh? People drive under the influence, bad. I want to live under the influence of the spirit of God and the gospel truth. Kingdom thinking is vital for us to live out the kingdom life that Jesus brought to planet earth. And if you don't know what kingdom thinking is, you've got to abide in the gospel because that's where Jesus unpacked and unfolded. Every conversation that he had was a revelation of what God's kingdom life looks like on planet earth. When man thinks this, I say that. When man wants to do this, I say, think about that. And you know what being a Christian is? It's being a, a perpetual scholar learning what the kingdom of God is like on planet earth. Jesus continually corrected his disciples mid-course because they needed the renewing of their minds the whole time, changing the way that they think. Repentance simply means changing the way you think. To live a life of repentance is to live a lifestyle of a continual renewal of your mind by the gospel of Jesus Christ, by kingdom thinking. Arresting negative thoughts, and f- sorry, arresting negative and faithless and non-kingdom of God, of God thoughts is our responsibility. It's yours and it's mine to arrest the non-kingdom thoughts the non-gospel thoughts. Take hold of it. You're powerful to do that. Thirdly, God doesn't want to think for us, but us to think His way, ways that bring freedom, good relationship, good health, can I just stop there? Do you know that, that anxious thoughts corrode your physical health? So, is this straight, straightforward? So that, that's what, it's been proven over and over by science it's proven. An anxious thought manifests in the body. Good health, good futures weighs under the influence of the spirit. And it's a process this thing. Last scripture, Romans 12, 1 to 2. I appeal to you, Paul says, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, God is merciful, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed. This This is a command now. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, the way the world thinks, the thoughts of the world, the lies of the world, the deception, the humanistic philosophies of the world, do not be conformed to them, but be transformed by the repentance, the changing the way you think, the renewal of your mind, gospel thoughts, kingdom thoughts, kingdom thoughts arresting, truth arresting lies. There's a continual shaping going on. And you know what? New trains of thought are being built up. So as, neg- as, um, as powerful as a negative thought is that becomes a train of thought with momentum that is, ca- that is just careering through, so powerful are kingdom thoughts, the gospel thoughts that become a train of thoughts, that become a belief system, that become a worldview. That's, how, that's the, com- the, the complete opposite. Yeah. And Jesus lived with that power. I hear what my father 
is thinking. And I say what he's saying. And he was the only one to have ever mastered life. And that is, if you're a Christian, that's your rabbi. That's your teacher. That's, you're an apprentice of him. Abiding in his truth. And arresting every lie. Yeah. That we want to perpetuate. That keeps us bound. Yeah. And not thriving. God is life. He is the author of life. The devil's a murderer. He's the robber of life. Choose who you want to believe. Let's stand together.